From the murky waters of the sportsman's paradise, stories emerge. Stories of the generations of people who have shared in the bounties of the land. Stories of communities that have persevered through natural disasters. Stories of the abundance of fish, wildlife, and adventures that create an ecosystem rich in diversity. And from the silted banks of the mighty Mississippi to the soggy marsh bottoms, from the tops of towering pine forests to the depths of the salty gulf, human and animal have shared this fortune for centuries. Enjoy these stories as told by outdoor journalists who travel across our state documenting the adventure, sportsmanship, and heritage that make us Bayou Wild. On this week's episode of Bayou Wild, join us on a journey from the streets of New Orleans to the banks of the False River as we explore the different ways to immortalize wildlife. Meet two Louisiana artists with unique and different skills and a fascination with outdoor creatures. It's the tale of two Leslies. We highlight the Gayutaku art of Leslie Charleville. Before I started printing, I was an artist. You know, I did paintings and drawings. Um, and I thought I'd I thought I knew what a fish looked like, but then I realized quickly after I started printing that I had no idea what a fish looked like. And just like the little intricate details that are so different from one to the, to the other. and Taxidermy by Leslie Dalton. For me, most of my clients are interior designers or people who want pieces for their homes, not necessarily hunters. I think the worlds can collide because essentially we're, we're still creating the same thing. You know, I think they appreciate the beauty of nature and the beauty of a finished piece, but for possibly different reasons. Plus, spring means crawfish season. This week, Don features a method he calls high-tech seafood boiling. Right after putting in about 35, 36 pounds of crawfish into it after it came to a boil, it came back to a boil in three minutes. That's quick. Closed captioning made possible by CETO.com. Become a member. In 1967, Dutch Stagner realized his dream to run his own meat market. Fifty years and three generations later, Double D and the Stagner family still operate with Dutch's original commitment to quality. Pick up some Double D sausage today and share your good times with us on Facebook. I've been using Louisiana fish fry products so much, even the kids are getting into it. Funny old bag, boil, boil, a great crawfish every time. And whether you're boiling crawfish, shrimp, or crabs, Louisiana fish fry products use the perfect blend of garlic, onion, spices, and salt for your seafood boil. So look for the bright yellow bag and pour and boil with Louisiana fish fry products. I didn't know much about Giyutaku uh, for a long time, um, really just in the last couple of years since I've gotten into fishing. A friend of mine had a tuna print done and it was very striking, but what made it so unique was that it was the actual fish. It was the fish that he caught. It had the exact measurements of the sickle fins, the scars, the colors. So when you're getting a Giyutaku print, you're pretty much getting the actual identity of the animal. You're getting the scars on it, you're getting the fin sizes. Anything that reminds you of that animal is in that print, whether it's an extra hook from somebody else who caught it to a battle wound it escaped from another fish. It is the exact animal and you're pretty much immortalizing that creature. 
It is very personal. I, I did a, a print of a blue marlin and it had four gaff marks on it. And, you know, I could have painted that out. I could have gotten rid of it, but I felt like there's a story attached to it. There are four people that that were pulling it in, you know, so I left it. Maybe those are the details that you're not gonna get on a fiberglass mount. Leslie, we met you last summer and we kind of got a crash course in Giyutaku. So since we met last, you did Swole Fest. What are some of the projects you've worked on that you're really proud of that you've done since then? Since then, business has really picked up and um, I do a lot of fishing tournaments and fishing rodeos, but now I'm getting a lot more um, requests to do some commercial projects. I was recently commissioned by Baton Rouge Area Foundation to um, do the artwork for their brand new uh, water campus in downtown Baton Rouge. Um, that was a pretty exciting project and I've done, I've had the opportunity to, opportunity to do some complete projects at uh, doctor's offices and, and restaurants where I can lay out a concept and then just submit it. And a lot of times with something like an alligator, um, you really get a lot of detail right there pulled directly off of, of the animal. And with something like um, the Sakale, there's so many little intricate um, details and spots and specks and scale patterns involved where whenever I get home I'll stretch it and just start going back over it and adding those little um, things that make the fish and give it its character. The tuna tail that I brought obviously was a little dried out. It was a couple weeks old and it had been in the freezer. Is it harder to do smoother smoother animals like that, like a tuna or a catfish or something that doesn't have the pronounced, does that require more brushing up and more tuning? It does. Um, something like a, a, like a, I mean tuna have scales, they're just really tiny. Um, there is like a pattern on their skin that you can capture. Whenever it's dried out it's sometimes harder to, to do that. Um, but it does, it requires a little bit different touch. I mean every, I feel like every animal requires a different touch and a different application to the paint. Um, something like the soccer, like you go, you brush in the direction of the scales so that you're not pulling the scales back and, you know, loosening them up where they come up with the print. Uh, something like the tuna, it may not matter quite as much, but you're dealing with the brush strokes appear appearing on the, um, on the fish. And without a lot of pronounced scales, you really see those brush strokes, so you want to try to avoid, it's like finding a balance between brushing it on, removing the brush strokes, you know, but each one poses its own set of challenges and opportunities to make a really good piece of art. A lot of times the first print that I pull is, it might be okay, but it's not necessarily um, my favorite or the one that captures the most detail. It depends on how wet the animal is. Um, sometimes the paint gives it, the first print kind of provides a layer and a barrier for, you know, fish are wet. I mean, they, they bleed, they, you know, they have the, the, the slime and the, the secretions in it and um, sometimes the paint after like the first couple pulls it, it provides a barrier and then by the third or fourth you can you can really get some good detail um, with them. Uh, you've done everything from you know a pound and a half sockele to a thousand pound marlin. Um, what's the timing for, for say an average fish, a red snapper, it's a very popular thing to do. If somebody wants a complete one, how long does that take? It can happen quick, but it depends on how backed up I am. I mean, if I get to working on it right away, you can have it back within just a couple weeks. And when you sit down and do it, uh, what does one print like that take in terms of time? I mean, we did, we, we knocked out 10 prints here in a little over an hour, but when you really do that extra added element, how much more work is involved? Um, I can, sometimes with, um, with fish that have like a lot of um, really pronounced scales and, and patterns, I can spend a solid two days working on it. Um, you know, with other demands going on, I mean, I might work, at, work on it a couple hours every day over the course of a few weeks, but um, 
I just take it one layer at a time, one mark at a time, and um, until I feel like, oh, that's it, there you are. So since we discussed Giyutaku last year, uh, you kind of see a little bit more in-depth elements to the art. What we did last year was a crash course, the basics on how you can do your own prints. But when you take the time and you're not in an area where the elements affect you, as in wind or sun, if you've got a nice shaded area where the paint doesn't dry so quickly, where you're not worried about your canvas moving on you, you really can pull a remarkable print. And this is something you can do too. Leslie's obviously very talented at it. She's uh, pretty much done thousands of prints and knows how to lay the canvas and paint the paint. That's something I need a lot of work on, but I think over time you get better at it. And what's neat to see is you can make multiple prints. It's not like one piece of art where if you mess it up, it's all over and you start from scratch. You can start from scratch, but it's very easy to get another pull. And in fact, with five or six different prints, they actually start to get better as you get more paint on them. It's that time of year, CCA Star Tournament time. We might have a star winner, folks. Don't miss your chance for more categories, more prizes, and more smiles. Young and old, there's a division for everyone. You can win a truck, RV, boat, and much more. Sign up today for a chance to become an early bird winner. The fun starts Memorial Day weekend. Visit CCA Star to get your ticket today. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference. I was introduced to taxidermy like most folks. I began hunting, shot my first deer and duck, and had them mounted. A whole new world of taxidermy was shown to me when I met Leslie Dalton and her friend Dakota Rose. Taxidermy as art. And boy, is it beautiful. I pretty much completely found this on my own. Yeah, I, I didn't really have any other friends who were doing it. I had friends who collected it, and I was also a collector. And so I had friends who had tons of mounts and also sort of exotic things in their homes. Maybe that also sparked my interest in it as well, was just seeing other collectors and my own collection. Well, when I went to school, it was very much a commercial taxidermy studio, so you just learn the basics, which was great because you learn someone's methods of how to do things quickly and efficiently and accurately. I've been lucky enough to meet people along the way who I've collaborated with and everyone's super friendly and just wants to get together and hang out and do taxidermy even if they've never met you. I, I was trained in commercial taxidermy. The first classes I took it was deer, game heads, um, but I always knew that wasn't what I wanted to focus on. and they all kind of made fun of me of like not doing deer, not doing tons of ducks, especially in the Midwest. It, they just didn't see how I would be able to do interior design aesthetic pieces. 
Taxidermy as an art form bridges the gap between hunters and non-hunters. Basically anyone that appreciates animals will appreciate the beauty and time put into this work. For me, most of my clients are interior designers or people who want pieces for their homes, not necessarily hunters. I think the worlds can collide because essentially we're, we're still creating the same thing. I think hunters typically want a different aesthetic than what I would produce. You know, I think they appreciate the beauty of nature and the beauty of a finished piece, but for possibly different reasons. These artists use taxidermy to highlight the beauty of nature, but not in the same way that hunters do. Most of their donations come from sanctuaries, private areas, and zoos. If I give something to someone as a gift to because it's deceased, she's not making any money off her. If it's, a, if it's an endangered species, you can't make money off that type of stuff. You know, that's highly illegal. But if I want something that I have that's passed to give to someone so she can, or for herself just to have, yes, it's, I would definitely do that. And I don't have to do anything. It's not like transporting live animals back and forth. Some things smell worse than others. <laughs> yeah. My friend's chicken died, her pet chicken, and she gave it to me, and it had been sick for a while. So throughout the whole skinning and cleaning and fleshing <laughs> process, it was not nice. Like something passes at the zoo, or uh, they want to move this in, or Gomek, St. Augustine Alligator Farm the largest crocodile in captivity past, taxidermy. He's in the middle of the zoo for everyone to see. I took a baby zebra that I had worked on, a collaboration project with a couple other artists. Um, that's now in one of the oldest natural history museums in the world. We exported that out to Holland. I've got work in the Santa Barbara Museum, um, and I just redid a bunch of dioramas for the Science Center of Iowa. So I, I will do traditional animals for in those museum settings. I, I really much enjoy. Both of these artists love the exotic creatures, especially birds. In fact, they get them from all around the world. I've always loved swans um, and sitting in the park and watching them and just being around them. So I've always thought they were extremely beautiful. I also really like doing parrots because they're so beautiful. And although they're difficult, they the end product is stunning. We did a bunch of parrots on a cage together. Um, and there was another girl, Lauren, that helped us, and we all kind of assembly lined. We all had our own birds, we all, and then put them together and kind of collaborated on this huge, beautiful piece that I really enjoy. Um, the strangest thing I've worked on is probably one of the, you know, a cyclops goat or a two-headed calf. I get a lot of, of weird things like that. A sanctuary gave me a black leopard that they had passed away, so I'm really excited to do my first big cat. I would love to do an alligator. I think we can help you. Yeah, yeah, I would love to do an alligator. I It would just be really exciting and I think alligators are really beautiful and I've grown up around them and so it would just be something really exciting to do. If you're lucky enough to bag a deer or a hog this season, bring it here to Double D. Double D processes hogs and exotic game and guarantees your product is always the meat you brought to Double D. Double D meets in Bogalusa, home of country smoked, spicy jalapeno cheddar, and other customized flavors. Bring your deer or your hog here to Double D, where you always get your meat back in return. It's worth a drive to Bogalusa from anywhere. Double D. Today we're out at Crawfish Haven, and we just caught a nice, fresh mess of crawfish, and I'm talking about fresh. They were swimming in the water about 20 minutes ago, and we're getting ready to boil them. What I'd like to show you today is my method of boiling. A lot of people compliment me on my crawfish coming out perfect every time. Well, there's also some efficiency and some money-saving things you can do, too, when you're boiling your seafood. First of all, I want to talk about using propane. 
Propane is a much more efficient fuel than natural gas. It burns hotter, which means you use less of it. It certainly is a whole lot more portable and you can do your seafood boil anywhere you like. Next thing I'd like to talk about is an invention called a rocket pot. This is a pot that has just kind of revolutionized the boiling market. What it has done, the inventor attaches studs through a special welding process to the bottom. This increases the burning surface on the bottom, which attracts more heat. It gets much hotter, much quicker. So your initial boil comes to a boil a lot quicker than a standard pot. And then once you put the crawfish in and you get that tendency for it to cool down and it takes a while to come back, it comes back much quicker. It saves you time, also saves you energy because you're not using as much fuel. The other part of my efficiency cooking involves a product called the Boil Boss. This is a, a very good invention that's come up. You hook a simple garden hose to it, you fit it over the top of your pot, and it's kind of like a sprinkler system. And it shoots cold water on the outside of your pot. Now, what that does is two things. One, it cools down the temperature inside the pot. Crawfish cannot absorb seasoning at temperatures above 150 degrees. So you use a thermometer, and when that temperature gets less than 150, that's when you can get your good soak time where the seasonings being absorbed into the seafood. The Boil Boss is a very simple product. I'll demonstrate to you how you can use that. The other thing is using uh, the product Louisiana Fish Fry. A lot of people spend an awful lot of time mixing pepper, mixing salt, mixing onion, granulated garlic. The list goes on and on. And guess what? A lot of times they blow it. It never comes out the same way twice. The people at Louisiana Fish Fry with their one pour boil have spent a lot of time perfecting it to get it just right where you got just the right amount of salt. It's not too much. It's not too light on the salt either and the perfect blend of seasonings. So when you combine the propane, the rocket pot, the boil boss, and your instant one pour boil from Louisiana Fish Fry, you've got one of the most efficient and cost-saving ways to boil seafood. Right, this is the rocket pot. Now you can see here there are numerous studs all across the bottom that takes a special well to keep them from coming off of here. What this does, by having these studs, you're not just cooking with the bottom of the surface, you're cooking with an expanded surface, subtracting and holding more heat, and that more intense heat decreases your boiling time and comes back to your ball a whole lot quicker. Alright, we got this to come to a roll and boil in six minutes. Now there's going to be variables. We've got a lot of wind out here today and that wind kind of disperses the flame. So without that wind in a protected place it would have boiled even quicker. Now we're going to find out how long it takes to come back after the crawfish are put in. This is one of the latest inventions for high-tech seafood boiling. This is called the Boil Boss. It's a pretty simple apparatus. It'll fit on a variety of pots by just locating the brackets on the edges and keeping it around away from the edge of the pot. It connects to a regular garden hose, and if we can have some water, we'll show you exactly what it's going to do. The idea of this is to serve a couple of purposes. One, it's going to cool down your boil much, much quicker, and when it's doing that, it lowers the temperature and I always suggest using a thermometer. And when it gets to 150 degrees, that's when the seafood actually starts absorbing the seasoning. Up until that point, it's still cooking. And you don't want to overcook your seafood because then it becomes difficult to peel. One of the only things you need to do here, while this is spraying the water, 
is make sure you constantly stir that water in your pot because what will happen is it'll cool the edges but the interior stays very hot. By rotating it and stirring it, you move the water from the middle to the edges where it cools quicker. What this does is it does not dilute the strength of your boil. So your salt and your spices still remain real potent in there without putting a lot of extra water. Also, it saves money as well as time. You don't have to go out and buy 10 pound bags of ice to put into your boil. The Boil Boss, wonderful invention. high-tech seafood boiling. It's high-tech, but it still makes the seafood taste great. We'll see you next time. Want to be seen on a Bayou Wild episode? Sign up for our Cajun Invasion wild pheasant hunt in the remote hills of South Dakota in mid-November. Bad River Bucks and Birds provides lodging, meals, transportation, dogs, and bird cleaning. Details at DonTheOutdoorsGuy.com. In 1967, Dutch Stagner realized his dream to run his own meat market. Fifty years and three generations later, Double D and the Stagner family still operate with Dutch's original commitment to quality. Pick up some Double D sausage today and share your good times with us on Facebook. Discover the taste of Louisiana that's seasoned just right. Boiled to perfection. Enriched with tradition. A taste that's savory, crispy, and a little sweet. Discover the taste of Louisiana fish fry products. Thanks for watching Bayou Wild. Hope you'll join us for our next episode. And you can check out all of our episodes on our YouTube channel. We have them, all the recipes as well, and the full-length episodes. Just search Bayou Wild TV, hit that subscribe button, and check out our website, BayouWildTV.com, if you want to pick up some merchandise. We've got hats, shirts to get you prepared for summer fishing.